So hi everybody. This is a two-year program, right? Uh, so how many of you were here last year when we did this? Yeah, so there's a lot, a lot of faces I, I, I remember in the crowd. So anyway, well, thank you for coming back to hear me twice. I hope I can uh, say something different than I said last time to keep things interesting. And uh, for all of you, this is uh, the first time, uh, as, uh, as Paul said, the, uh, uh, this has become a tradition. I, I, I do this once a year and, and, uh, and then go out afterwards for a a drink or two. Um, so I, I think it's a great format. I like it a lot. It allows us to have like a group conversation and then also some, you know, more one-on-one -on -one conversations later on. So I, I really like that a lot. Uh, over the years, I've talked about various different things uh, in, in with this group. And tonight, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I think are some interesting uh, new developments in the technology landscape and things that I've been thinking a lot about. And I don't have any uh, crystal balls uh, and I certainly don't have any investments uh, that I can point to yet that um, uh, are uh, in and around uh, these areas, but I, but I thought I would just sort of uh, talk about some of the things that are interesting to me and then um, when I'm done with that, maybe uh, we'll turn it over for questions and answers. So there's a couple things that you know, I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, one of them is what we've witnessed over the past four or five years with the emergence of smartphones and tablets and, uh, and the fact that you know, we, we didn't necessarily get rid of our uh, laptops and desktop computers. We still use those, um, but our, our phones and our tablets are um, complementary devices that um, we, we spend you know, meaningful amounts of, of time using uh, instead of uh, desktop and laptop computers. And there are certain things that, certain kinds of applications that um, we do on both. There's certain kinds of applications we tend to do on one, not the other. Um, and there's certainly a number of applications that have come about um, in the world of uh, smartphones, I think more, um, more so than tablets, but um, uh, you know, certainly mobile devices have, have created the emergence of, of new kinds of applications that weren't possible on laptop or desktop computers. And, and I think that the next, uh, you know, set of devices that, that will come along um, will be like that too, where, you know, they won't cause us to stop using um, the computing devices that we use today, um, but, but will start to give us the ability to have um, new capabilities and, and new features, and there will be new applications um, that you know, entrepreneurs maybe such as yourself will create um, that could not have existed um, on the devices that we that we have today. And I think two of the more interesting uh, categories that I'm certainly paying a lot of attention to are watches and glasses. Um, and I don't I don't I don't wear a watch, and I don't normally wear glasses either. Um, although I I'm increasingly need to put on glasses if I need to read. You're going to turn that off. I'm just being told it sounds like you're on a 45 record yeah. as a result of crackling. Yeah, just turn it off. That's cool. Um, so, <laughs> so quiet now. <laughs> I like that background. High fidelity. Um, so, you know, I think what's, what's interesting to me about this sort of continuum that we're now starting to go down is that these complementary devices all connect to the cloud and um, and so we have a um, <clears throat> uh, we have a kind of uh, growing set of computing uh, uh, 
capabilities that, that are with us all the time and that they, they start to become additive and complementary to each other. So, uh, in, you know, I think all of us have the experience of using smartphones and applications on our smartphones that um, then when we get to our uh, desktop or laptop computers, um, we have, um, you know, the same state uh, there that we, we created on our, our smartphones. I guess a good example of that might be email that uh, you've done on your phone and you've um, either archived it or you labeled it or whatever on your phone and then when you get to your, uh, your laptop or desktop computer it's, it's, it's already in that state so that the states are synchronized. And, and I think, you know, this, this sort of new kind of paradigm that we're entering where uh, we're going to have maybe, you know, a half a dozen or more uh, computing environments and, and devices that are all uh, connected to each other um, and um, are useful in, in various modes and, and ways of interacting um, is, is pretty exciting to me. I also think that um, we will see, uh, I guess glasses and, and, and watches are, are in some ways existing, um, uh, you know, examples of existing uh, systems that we already use, but, but they're not, um, at least in the way that we use them today, they're not really computing devices. Um, but then there's also things that uh, we use that, you know, have had uh, computers in them for a while, like our cars and our TV sets, um, that I think are also going to increasingly be um, running, you know, smart operating systems and connected to the cloud. That potentially will also, um, you know, ex ex extend this continuum. Uh, and there was a word we used to use back in uh, the late '90s for this. We called it pervasive computing, and it sort of died. It was sort of a, it was a word that had a lot of hype around it and um, it was a vision that, you know, I think was, was well before its time and so, you know, kind of became passe and we stopped using that term. But I think that now we really are entering, you know, now uh, maybe almost 15 years after that word was coined, we're now starting to enter truly a world of pervasive computing uh, when you know, we've got a pair of glasses on that we can use to capture the things we're seeing and, and transmit it or um, watch uh, something or pull up a map and, and navigate ourselves without ever having to, you know, literally, you know, pull a device out and, and, and uh, turn it on or wake it up. And so, uh, you know, we're looking for applications uh, that couldn't have existed on smartphones or tablets or, or um, desktops or laptops that can now exist because of these, these new devices that are going to start to become mainstream. And, and uh, you know, we haven't uh, really found anything yet that, um, uh, you know, has, has, you know, convinced us to make an investment. And I think part of it is that, you know, we're, we're, we don't yet really have these, these devices. Um, they're just beginning to come to the market. And I think over the next year or two, you know, I think that's when we'll start to see some of this innovation happen in terms of third-party applications. But what we like to think about is um, uh, what are the capabilities in these devices or what are the behaviors that people uh, exhibit with these devices that make things possible um, that that weren't possible before, and you know, I, I guess a really good example of that, uh, one that I like to use, is probably an overused example, is in the world of smartphones. You think about applications like Halo and Uber, um, where it wasn't until um, both the passenger and the driver both had a smartphone uh, with you know a modern operating system in it that was you know posting location. Uh, in real time that it was even possible to imagine, you know, that kind of use case. And yet, um, once, you know, both, both parties had that, there was no proprietary hardware that was required. There was no, really, the software, it wasn't that hard to build. 
Um, you know, it just required somebody to imagine the application, build it, put it into the market, and now, you know, <clears throat> millions of people are, are using that, those kinds of applications. And, and they, they really do provide meaningfully better experience for people, and, and there's a lot of uh, commerce and business that's happening because of that. So what are those things for glasses or watches or connected cars or, or connected televisions? And, and it's not, I mean, yes, there will be applications. Yes, we will be watching <clears throat> House of Cards on Netflix on our smart TVs. But, you know, that's not really a new behavior. That's just a, <clears throat> that's an old behavior that's been slightly changed and delivered into a smart television. But, but that's not a truly transformative new behavior. And so I think that's what we're thinking a lot about. Um, so that's one big sort of mega trend. The other <clears throat> big <clears throat> sort of mega trend that we've been thinking a lot about is machine learning. And it's sort of related in some ways, at least I like to think that these two trends are related. But, <clears throat> you know, the promise of artificial intelligence and machine learning has been around for 30 years. And for much of that 30 years, um, it's been underwhelming. You know, we've been promised voice recognition, we've been promised face recognition, we've been promised image recognition. And honestly, you know, we really haven't gotten that. Um, and the technology has not really improved much over the years until recently. And if you if you could map the uh, if you could if, if you could map the um, the acceleration of innovation, or may, maybe not innovation, but of uh, capability in in the machine learning space or the artificial intelligence space. Uh, it would look, you know, kind of like an unimpressive growth curve uh, until very recently, and and I think we've hit a, a, a meaningful uh, change in in the slope of that curve in the past couple of years. And when you think about uh, machine learning, it's it's partially that the science and the technologies and the algorithms have improved a lot recently, but but really with machine learning, the real gains come when um, you can, you know. Um, uh, you know, shoot the fire hose uh, of data at the machine fast enough that the machines can start learning at a, at a faster and faster rate. And, and that's really what it takes uh, is just massive amounts of data because that's how machines learn um, is you just throw more and more stuff at them and the more you more throw at them the, the quicker the, the learning curve comes. And it is, it is a little scary, I mean, if we think about, you know, the uh, there's, there's actually particularly uh, intimidating Mark, Mark Andreessen quote that I came came upon recently where he said uh, something like um, in the future there'll be two kinds of jobs there'll be the people who tell the machines what to do and there'll be the people who the machines tell what to do um, and that's a little scary um, but he's probably you know there's a fair bit of truth to that which is partially why it's so so scary because uh, none of us want to be being ordered around by a bunch of machines We've seen too many sci-fi movies like that, I think. Um, but anyway, you know, I think we're seeing, uh, starting to see some real, uh, real significant improvements in things like voice recognition and image recognition. Uh, and and you know, I think Google is probably the company that's benefiting the most from this because the sheer vast amounts of our data that they have access to in the cloud. Um, and more and more of it every day through our search results, through our emails, through our calendars, um, and so on and so forth, and, and, and through our you know, Google Voice uh, messages and, and all that stuff. All that data is being you know, thrown at machines and machine learning algorithms, and they're getting smarter and smarter. So um, just a couple examples of things that have kind of blown me away in, in the past couple of weeks. Uh, I was in Salt Lake City uh, maybe a week and a half ago, and I was at uh, an event uh, where we were speaking, and then there was a dinner afterwards, and the dinner was like at 6.15 or 6.30, I forget exactly when, and my phone vibrated, and I looked at my phone, and there was a, a, a mobile notification from Google Now that said something like, you know, your dinner is at 6.15, it's nine minutes away, you better leave in two minutes. You know, I don't know if anybody else uses Android and has Google Now on their phone, but this is a brand new feature that just rolled out sometime in the past couple of weeks. And, you know, it, it shocked me because I'd never gotten a notification like that. And then I thought about it. I said, well, they've got, 
you know, my calendar, so they know where I am right now. Well, they actually know where I am right now because my phone knows where I am right now. They know where I'm supposed to be. Uh, they've got Google Maps. They pretty much know how far away that is. I mean, it's not shocking they could send me that notification, but, but that's the kind of intelligence that we're starting to get. Um, and, you know, Google uh, voice recognition, um, uh, the type ahead prompts now that, that you get uh, when you're typing on a phone. Uh, I think both with Apple and Google, but I think, um, uh, again, I think Google does it better. It's like I don't even need to, uh, to type anymore. It's like I just start typing and it feels like the phone actually knows what I'm saying. I don't even need to, to tell it what I'm saying. And so, uh, so to tie that back to this sort of pervasive computing thing, um, it's since all of these devices are uh, going to be connected to software and services in the cloud, um, our data that our data exhaust that we're creating with all these devices is just going to be making these systems smarter and smarter and smarter and better and better and better for us. And so, I think that there's a, a scary element to that, but I also think that there's an exciting element to that. And for entrepreneurs who are creating products and services, these are two vectors that I think are really interesting to think about. Um, one is, you know, what are the applications and services that, that you can provision on these devices that you could not provision before without them? And what is the benefit that you can get from machine learning and, and you know, uh, data in the cloud that's uh, available to all these devices at the same time in real time? And uh, I think that's going to be, you know, the inter maybe the intersection of those two vectors or certainly innovation along both of those vectors is where we think a lot of the most interesting uh, things are, things are going to happen. Um, I'll tell you about one idea that, that my partner Albert uh, has been writing a bit about that, that I'm pretty inspired by. The, the, the challenge for uh, entrepreneurs um, is, uh, in competing against somebody like Google, is that they, um, they have this massive advantage in terms of data. And they have a massive advantage in terms of the number of um, data scientists that they have. They have some of the best uh, minds in the world uh, focused on building, um, building their machine learning algorithms. So the idea that Albert uh, mentioned, which, I, which uh, he wrote about this on his blog and, and I really like, is to think of machine learning as a service in the same way that um, Amazon uh, has created Amazon Web Services and because, you know, tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs are building, uh, building their products and services on top of Amazon's um, servers in the cloud, Amazon can provide those services at very, very high levels of reliability and, and service availability um, and at lower and lower prices. Um, and, and that's because everybody's sort of coming together in, in kind of a shared usage model and using the same set of technology. So if you think about machine learning as a service, um, it would look something like that, where uh, instead of uh, you know, hundreds of entrepreneurs uh, building their own uh, data sets and their own machine learning uh, uh, technology and algorithms, um, you would essentially provision machine learning as a service where uh, companies would build on top of a platform, machine learning platform, like provision like Amazon Web Services, where uh, because there was literally thousands of companies or maybe tens of thousands of companies using the same platform, the d data value, you know, just again shooting this fire hose of data at the machines, um, in the aggregate could be as large as, as Google's and that we could all benefit collectively from, you know, the uh, improvements that would come from that. And so that's an interesting idea. We haven't seen anybody doing that. I think there's a bunch of technical issues about how one would actually provision um, a service like that that, you know, haven't been solved. I'm not even sure that it, it, it's, it's actually doable, but that's an idea that sort of has captured my imagination. Um, so the, the, that's kind of where we're looking. That's where what, where my head is right now in terms of things I want to see, um, and uh, and so um, you know I want to get out and and talk about these ideas and evangelize these ideas. Um, 
because you know the more we do that, the more entrepreneurs who are working on these problems will will um, seek us out, uh, show us the opportunity to invest in their companies. Also, uh, we'll get smarter about these ideas by talking to people working in the space, um, and maybe they'll get smarter by talking to us, and uh, that'll lead to ideally not just one investment, but you know uh, maybe you know dozens of investments over the next few years.